Hello everyone. So let's now talk about the third process, which is the collect requirements. So initially in this knowledge area, we first discussed about the plan and now we would be discussing the collect requirement, the second process and third video after the introduction. Collect requirements for me, it's, it's uh, in this particular knowledge area, it's, it's my personal favorite and I'll tell you why because uh, in the past I have been, uh, I was actually a business analyst it's, it's some long time back and I used to deal with scope, uh, these requirements, collecting requirements, talking to people a lot. So this is one of my personal uh, uh, favorite because of that reason, but not just because of that, but also it's, uh, it's, it's the examiner's favorite also. You'll get a lot of questions uh, from this particular process, specifically around the tools and techniques. They will uh, give you many scenarios on the tools and techniques. They will describe you and they'll ask you uh, uh, what all questions, uh, like, you know, what is the tool which we use? What is the technique which we used? And th this would be one set of questions. And then uh, the output will have the requirement documentation and the traceability matrix. You will get questions on, uh, on those two uh, particular documents as well, specifically on the traceability matrix. What are the different contents and things like that? Okay, so let's see what we have. It's a planning process that creates the requirement documentation and always remember requirement documentation, it should always be smart. So smart S specific, specific, M is measurable, A is attainable, R is realistic, and T is time bound. So when I say a requirement should be smart, what do I really mean is specific. Like if I say I want to go somewhere, somewhere, what is somewhere? It's not that specific enough. If I say I want to go to New York, right? Now I'm specific that Varun shall go to New York. So that's, that's specific. Then it should be measurable. Like, uh, from where I'm going. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm traveling from DC to New York. So DC to New York, it's let's say around uh, how much? It's around uh, 150 to 200 miles. So around 150 to 200 miles. So that's, that's my measurement. I'm measuring it. It should be attainable. Is it? I'm not saying that, you know, Varun shall go to moon. Of course, for some people, for astronaut, that might be possible, but uh, not for me. So again, the requirement should be smart measurable and attainable. Yes, Varun can go from DC to New York. So that's attainable. It should be realistic. Yes, it should be uh, realistic, like the same example, like, you know, I'm not saying uh, the same example of going to moon or Mars and all those things. That's that's not realistic. And it should be time bound. It should be associated like Varun shall go to New York from DC before the end of this year. So if I'm saying before the end of this year, I'm actually violating the clause of uh, specific because it's not too specific, but of, at least it is that, you know, it is associated like the time timing constraint is mentioned over there. So, or if I say I shall go in the next month or 15th of next month, that's, that's, that's actually um, like, you know, good. It's, it's time bound. It's very specific. It's good. So all of these requirements should always be smart. And most of the time, the requirements are actually shall statements. S H A L L shall or must statement. Like the product must do this. The product like the car must have heated seats. The car must have leather interiors. So that it's must. So that's or car, my, my customized car shall have, um, uh, 22 inches tires. So all of those are very specific requirements. The success and quality of the project begin with the stakeholders requirements. So it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, you discuss with the customer, you discuss with the stakeholders and try to gather their inputs. Okay. Try to ask them, try to, this is a smart business analyst. This is what he or she does. They reach out to them, they talk to them, they try to gather as many requirements as possible. They will ask different questions. They will actually, you know, diverge them. They will actually, they would lead the discussion to make sure they can get the maximum information possible from them. This process will lay the groundwork for all the future project activities. So until and unless, 
I repeat, until and unless you don't have a specific requirements, your dev team, your development team will come back to you and ask you all the necessary questions. So again, you as a business analyst must have, like probably might go back uh, to the customer, reach out, uh, discuss about those questions and then, you know, discuss about it. So again, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, your requirements are very specific, are, are smart, uh, they are documented in a proper way so that, you know, your dev team has less questions, there are no change requests, like you want to avoid change requests, to be honest. Focus. This process happens very early in the life of the project. So it happens very early because basically when the first time I actually went to the dealer, I talked and, and I discussed him about my car specification, that was like very early. Uh, yes, of course, I procrastinated for a while, but uh, once my lazy period was done, I went there and I, I started actively looking for it. It should be smart. The major output will be the requirement documentation. So there are many types of requirement documentation. Some people use the, um, uh, you know, the business requirements. Some people have uh, solution requirements, functional requirements, non-functional requirements. So all of those things are actually part of uh, that. Then we will also have the requirements traceability matrix, uh, an important uh, deliverable, uh, an important output from this process, uh, which, which says the origin of each requirement is listed in the traceability matrix. Like what was the real origin of that? We'll be discussing about these, uh, this one in, in much more detail, but ag again, many questions from this. Remember, the outputs are important. Um, and when you read the PIMBOK, make sure that uh, you know you are reading the bullet points of those outputs these videos are just one piece i am what i am over here and what i am trying to do is i'm trying to make your life easier by giving you um, you know a, real life examples by making sure that you can relate to um, like if you are probably you know thinking in your mind and you know you are thinking okay this is how you went there you went to the dealer you 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 discuss about your requirements on all those if you're thinking if you are visualizing it then I would say half of my job is already done. But the other remaining ha half and the more important half is actually on you. You have to read the PIMBOK. You might hear on Google that I did not read the PIMBOK. I just watched the videos and I just did the questions. And some of the students say that to me as well. Like, Varun, I just watched your videos and I was so happy. I just solved your question. I was done. I was good. But that is never my recommendation. Make sure that you know, you at least for the first time, you read the PIMBOK cover by cover after watching the videos, of course, because once you watch the videos, PIMBOK, reading PIMBOK would be much easier for you. If you think it's it's little complex, this is something which will help you to understand those concepts in an easy manner. And the third step should be to make sure that, you know, you do the practice questions first based upon the knowledge area. And once that is done, then uh, uh, you should do the, practice a lot of uh, full length tests as well. I would say at least four. So make sure you go on the website and try all the four, uh, you know, three to four module test papers. Very important if you're scoring good, um, uh, like my tests are, are on a little difficult side, but if you're scoring around, I would say around 70%, then you should feel confident that, you know, you are on the right track. Okay, let's discuss the ITTOs. So now this process is important in terms of the ITTOs. And uh, why do I say so? It's specifically relating to the tools and techniques. So the tools and techniques, they will give you a lot of tools and techniques. Uh, they, they'll give you scenarios and they'll ask you, the question would be, which tool would be best in this type of scenario? Or the question might be, which of the tool uh, did the project manager used? So they'll like, describe a situation, they'll give you a scenario, and based upon that, they will ask you the question. Uh, the question. Uh, remember, you know, you, you might get a lot of easier questions, you might get a lot of difficult questions, but the real PMP questions, which, which when you go and sit in the exam, are most of them are scenarios. They want you to visualize with them. They want you to see you give you some real life examples, real life stories behind it so that you can relate to the questions, you can think through it. So practice the questions which are scenario based, which could actually help you a lot in, in, in your preparation. And also remember, you know, when you submit your test, you need to see, um, you know, what are the, where you are lacking, like it will tell you that, okay, you scored 
you know, 10% in uh, integration, 10% in scope, 50% in the time, 80% in communication. So you know that you're good in communication, but you're not doing good in that. So it has to be structured on your knowledge area. Also, it should be structured on the process groups because the answer sheet, if you remember, I showed you the um, the answer sheet in the introduction slide, like this is how your end result will look like. This is how it will show you that, okay, well, you were above target or you were on target or you were, uh, you know, you need improvement. All those things would also be discussed over there. Uh, so that's important. And I, I think the third piece that you should also know, that there would be few mathematical questions. There would be majorly uh, some direct ITTOs, not, not much, I would say two to three direct ITTOs, but uh, it keeps on changes initially um, if, if you were doing if you were studying at that time they might ask but not anymore now it's like I would say straightforward questions are like one or two which are directly asking about the ITU but the major questions are scenario based major questions so when you practice on the simulator when you do or uh, a full length test you, you will see that I have concentrated mainly on the scenario based questions because I want to give you guys a, a real life experience. Okay, so now let's talk about the ITTOs. So first we have the uh, project charter. Uh, we will talk about that in detail on the next page. Then on the project man uh, mo project management plan, we'll have the scope, requirements, and stakeholder. All three very important. Uh, on the document sides, we have the assumption log, lessons learned register, and the stakeholder register. Business document will get the business case. Uh, we discuss the business case in the integration management agreements. Yes, we, we deal with sellers all the time. So we'll get the agreements also. And finally, we'll have the EEF OPA or common ones. Okay, so let's let's discuss the ITTOs, uh, the inputs first. Okay. So first on the input side, we have the project management plan. So project management plan um, and basically what in project management plan, we will have the scope management plan and the requirements management plan. Remember, these were the outputs from the previous process, which was your plan scope management. So output of the previous process became the input to the next process, a very common scenario and I told you whatever things you need to be done whole through this knowledge area first needs to be planned. So you need to know what your scope management plan is. You need to know what your requirements management plan is. Okay. And of course you need the stakeholder engagement. Who is giving you these requirements? Is it, is it uh, your project team member? Is it like the customer? Is it like the sponsor? Is it something some like a VP or a director who is giving you those requirements? Like, how did I came up with my requirement for that customized car? Was it somebody my friend told me? Was it my, my, my family told me? How, how did those requirements came into picture? Right? So again, some stakeholders are important. Some stake, I, I'm not saying that uh, there are few non-important stakeholders, but some people are somebody who have, you know, very high power, high influence on your project. So, and they are, let's say, a very powerful person, those who don't have time. So, you know, you have to engage those stakeholders by using a different strategy by in comparison to somebody who is very easy going, you know, who is really accessible and, and you might get those requirements from them in a different manner. Then next we will also need the project charter, uh, project charter, the high level document, if you remember. Uh, so high level requirements are actually mentioned in the project charter. And uh, this is important because you want to start with those high level requirements. Then we have the uh, agreements. Uh, agreements, if you remember, uh, you know, agreement is something, it's, it's more like a contract, MOUs. So agreement is something which, uh, which we would be discussing in the procurement management knowledge area. But just remember, just think that, uh, you know, when you're dealing with sire, uh, sorry, seller, you have a buyer and seller relationship. When you have outsourced the work to them, you know, they would also help you to define your requirements. If you yourself are not sure what you really need, they would be the one who would actually guide you those. And how this process is being done, that's actually part of the agreement sections. That's the, how the procurement will be managed. So you need to know that as an input as well. Then if we see the project documents, we will have the assumption log. Assumption log is something which you assume to be true. Like for example, in our buying the car example, I assumed that uh, 
you know my friend would be the one who will help me on this process so he is the one who is actually helping me to you know gather the requirements so you have uh, assumption log as an input then lessons learned what were the mistakes which i did when i bought my previous car what were the mistakes i did okay i don't want to repeat that so i will go back i'll you know discuss it with my family and i'll ask them okay you know what what were the things which were not good oh the mileage was not good for that car or you know what the speed was also not that great i think the the back seats they were not very comfortable okay now these are like my top 3 priorities i don't want to repeat the same mistakes and you know i want to use that now i want to make sure whatever car i get customized i get the the good seats the mileage speed and i get all those things and similarly it's not just about the bad things it also about the good things let's see if i learned a good thing from my uh, previous car uh, experience like for uh, let, let's say i like the brand i probably might go for a different um, model of that uh, brand and and buy a different version like an upgraded version or something like that right so that would be part of your lessons learned register and then we have the stakeholder register stakeholder register is something which we would be discussing in the stakeholder management knowledge area this is actually an output of identify stakeholder process uh, which is part of your initiating process group so stakeholder register an important one of course who is giving you these requirements the people the stakeholders on your project the people those who want your project to be successful or the people those who don't want your project to be stake, uh, successful the negative stakeholders as well you want to gather the requirements from all of the stakeholders right and if any of your stakeholder is missed if you you miss a single stakeholder that's that's not a good thing you know why because at the end when it's a time to get an approval on your product then they might be you know reaching out to you and they might be saying oh you did not take my requirements you did not do this you did not do that then then it's a loss on your project why you would have to go back you would have to again do this uh, requirements and at the later stages of the project it might be more expensive for you so you don't want to do that right so make sure you have all the people identified on the project which will actually help you to gather those requirements then as far as the business document is concerned it will include the business case which will describe on how to meet the business need so business case is important uh, remember um, you know why you are doing this project you know is it uh, uh is uh, how, what were the goals is it meeting the organizational strategies or not the go no go decision all those were actually part of the business case so that is actually part of your uh, input uh, to, to to get to collect the requirements from stakeholders then the common ones we have the opa and the eef uh, as you all know eef is something more like you know the organization culture and opa is um, the same the processes the policies the pmis Uh, your lessons learned all those are part of your op updates so now let's actually talk about the most important piece of this process which is your tools and techniques so um many questions i i, I told you like you know we are talking about close to 10 questions in this collect requirements and majorly the questions would be uh, talking about deals tools and technique they'll give you the scenario they'll describe the scenario and they'll ask you which tool would be the best in this type of scenario or they will tell you uh, which tool you would use or uh, uh, not just use which tool did the project manager used okay so first we have the uh, expert judgment expert judgment we all know you know experts help you to gather the requirements to make sure you if you are very specific to that product like let's say if if i'm not if i don't know anything about the cars to be honest i don't uh, but uh, you know an expert can help me to understand what are the three more important most important things i need to take care of when i buy the car so an expert can help me for that as far as the data gathering is concerned we have uh, how to gather the data how to collect the requirements we have the brainstorming session we have the focus group we have interviews questionnaire surveys and benchmarking we already discussed the uh, the brainstorming let's go guys let's 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 work let's you know let's hurdle around let's talk about the requirement so a facilitator will conduct a brainstorming session where the group of stakeholders brainstorm about data solution or ideas so you will generate those ideas you will talk about the solutions uh, in in a brainstorming session then we do that all the time 
then uh, we have the focus group where a moderator will lead this interactive session and discuss about the stakeholders expectation about the product service or result so focus group now this is something which is i, I would say more focused it is about uh, you know one aspect which is the let's say the, the the comfort level so for me if i say i'm referring to the comfort level let's see i divided the uh, my my car requirements into different sections like security comfort uh, luxury uh, you can also say and then uh, uh, safety uh, then uh, you know the engine descriptions the specifications so let's first talk about the luxury what is the luxury piece i, I need I need it to be smooth when I'm driving on, let's say, you know, 100, 120 miles per hour. Of course, if it's in the speed limit, uh, you know, it should be comfortable. I should not feel that, you know, I'm over speeding or it should probably come up with some kind of notification stating that, uh, um, you know, I'm not doing the right thing or I, I'm over speeding. That will actually come under the uh, uh, safety feature. So that's focus group when I'm specifically focusing on one aspect to gather the requirement from the stakeholders. Then the third, we will have the interviews. Uh, interviews could be formal or informal. Um, it's, it's primarily a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Don't think that, oh, I have given a panel interview. So yes, that's true. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not denying that fact. So interviewed, uh, interviews might involve multiple people, but, but majorly it's more on a one-on-one. -on -one. So the keyword for this question would be one-on-one. -on -one. So if in this scenario, they're talking about that they are referring to one-on-one um, -on -one conversation, focus group, uh, sorry, uh, interviews uh, would be the answer for that. If they are specifically saying that we are focusing on one aspect or one product feature, then you can say that, you know, the focus group might be the answer for that question. Then similarly to these, uh, another data gathering techniques, we have the questionnaires and service, which is a written set of questions shared with stakeholders, which are geographically dispersed and you need a response in short turnaround time. So if, I don't know if, if you guys you know shop online or not, but if if, if you do, um, I'm pretty sure you might have gone to an e-commerce website and typed in www. you know xyzabc. com, and uh, you get the list of contents of whatever things are available, and and, and let's say you buy that uh, product. So you bought the product, and then you know after a certain span of time, you probably get an email. Uh, stating that okay how was the experience what was it good is is the product meeting your requirements is it something you would like us to uh, come up with some kind of upgrade so that's a questionnaire that's a survey which which specifically sent by the companies and why we do that basically we want to improve we want to gather the lessons learned from directly from the customer directly from the end user who can help us to improve our product so that's questionnaires and service so question and service like to be honest, I, I get a lot of my product features from the questionnaires and service. I, I discuss this all the time with my students and, you know, they always come up with some cool ideas. And I, uh, if, if uh, those ideas are uh, helping my, uh, you know, uh, students, I, I definitely try to talk to my dev team and, you know, I try to implement those. So that's the questionnaires and service. Then on the benchmarking side, what we do is it's a technique which helps you to compare your project goal with the already established projects. And um, I would say I'm a big advocate of uh, benchmarking and I'll tell you why. Um, when I created uh, the videos like for the first time, um, not for this version, but the previous version, the first thing I actually did was I went to YouTube um, and uh, you know, I watched the videos. I, I purchased uh, some of the big names in this industry and I watched those videos and um, I try to gather the good uh, good things from those videos. I try to see okay, what are the best things I could understand, learn? Is uh, are they are they making sense? Are they giving me good examples? Or or, or uh, I came across some good videos. I came across some bad videos also. Some were so some were so boring. Like you know, it was so monotonous. So for me, my benchmarking was that how I can make sure that I could match the quality level of the best one or how I could not, um, you know, how I, I'm not boring. So like, you know, how I'm not boring in my conversation, how I can make sure my users are listening to me, how I can make the session as interactive as possible. So for me, that was my benchmarking. I was comparing it with an already established product and I want to make sure that I, you know, I, I, I give I, of the same quality or, or even better quality than those products. 
Then as far as the data analysis is concerned, we have the document analysis. In this technique, the team reviews the existing document to collect as many requirements as possible. So we have some documents which are already established on a product uh, on a project. We review those documents. We make sure we try to gather the requirements and understand that whatever the things can help us on your project just to make sure that, OK, these are the features which I think should you know help the end user. That's that's document analysis. When we review the documents, which helps us to give the requirements for our product. Okay, so next, next, uh, next is still the tools and techniques. Uh, that's why I said it, it's very important. These tools are actually further divided into many, many uh, multiple uh, subheadings, which are important. So next, we have the decision making. So we briefly discussed about the decision making in the integration, but I told you at that time that uh, uh, majorly we will be discussing about the decision making in the scope management knowledge area. So first decision making how we will make a decision on those requirements like for example if you come back to the same example which i told you when i was your contractor and you called me to paint your wall initially it was white and then you told me to make it to yellow if you remember that example so voting right you are saying that um, um, it should be it should be of yellow color your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your, your father, your mother, all, all of them are saying, no, it should be pink. Somebody is saying red, blue, off white, off black, whatever. So, you know, there are tons of questions. So we need to make sure we come to a conclusive decision, like what we need to do, what I really want. So you as a customer over here have to decide. And for that, uh, the, you know, we uh, business analysts actually help to take a decision by doing the voting techniques. And there are major uh, decision making techniques. So first we have the uh, unanimity. Everybody has to agree to a decision. So when, when I say unanimity, like what do I do is uh, unanimity means that all five of us are in the same room and each one of us have to have to decide upon the have to give a unanimous decision, just like a, a veto power in the United Nations. So all of them have unanimously have to agree to that and then only they can move forward. That's a unanimity. Then we have the majority. More than 50% of the group member have to agree to a decision. So, you know, sometimes I, uh, you know, I come to a, I play some kind of games on our Facebook group where I offer uh, free access to our simulator. Uh, what we do is, you know, we we say that, OK, the stake or the the user who is most active on our uh, on our portal, on our social networking site, we probably will give you uh, like, you know, free access to the product. So it's it's like, a, you know, a monthly thing we do. Sometimes we do uh, and sometimes we stop and then we again come up with those kind of techniques. But we want user to be more interactive. But the solution is, is not taken by me. Of course, I have a. Uh, the final say but uh, majorly it's more on the majority side uh, like you know i will ask people to vote for a, some uh, like you know we will define the candidates everybody would vote for it and if i get somebody who is more than 50 percent of the uh, the person who is getting them uh, more than 50 percent of the votes will actually get that okay then we have the plurality the idea that gets the most votes win so this is Sometimes a lot of people get confused between the plurality and the majority. And I'll tell you what is the difference between that. So assume, you know, there is an election coming up and there are three candidates, A, B, and C. And let's say the number of voters are, let's say 10 voters. So let's say candidate A got four votes, candidate B got, let's say three votes, and candidate C got three votes. So total there were 10 voters out of which A got four, B got three and C got three. Now you would tell me that, you know, candidate A won the election because it has majority of the votes. I would say that's not correct. Why? Majority of the votes would have been more than 50%. So if we are talking about 10 votes over here, so somebody who would have got six or more votes would have won the election because of the majority. But candidate A won the election only because of the plurality technique, which is the idea that gets the most votes win. 
I repeat the idea that gets the most votes win. So A won the election because of plurality but not because of majority. Four people wanted candidate A to win but six people did not want it, candidate A to win. But still candidate A won because of the plurality technique. Then we have the uh, autocratic decision making. So one person takes the decision on behalf of the group. Like sometimes, you know, when there is some kind of conflict on the group, you know, then, uh, you know, uh, I chime in and I try to give them decisions. So uh, I, I try to guide the conversation. But if I see the conversation is not becoming healthy or it's, it's going out of hand, then I, you know, I, I stop the comment. Sometimes I delete the post and I actually go for this autocratic decision making. So it means that one person will take the decision on the behalf of others. Uh, you can say this could be forcefully done sometimes. Uh, like, like for example, if you're gathering the requirements, you are in a one room and like, you know, let, let's say the senior VP of the company is in the, in the room and nobody wants to go against that senior VP. So that senior VP, whatever senior VP is saying, everybody is agreeing. And or, or I would say the final say was of senior VP. That's actually an autocratic decision making technique. And I'm, I'm not saying it is right or I'm not saying it is wrong. It is just a type of decision making technique. And then we have the multi uh, multi criteria decision analysis. So multiple criteria are evaluated and ranked in a systematic manner to reach to a decision. So multiple criteria like A. The simulator should be of uh, the car should be uh, heated. The car should have um, good security features. The car should have good speed. The car should have good engine. All those were my uh, multiple criteria because of which I selected a car of brand A of model B. That's multiple criteria as well. Then we have the interpersonal and team skills. Interpersonal team skills. First, we have the observation and conversation which is also known as job shadowing, where an observer views individuals on how they are performing their day to day tasks. And this is something where, you know, I gather my requirements a lot. So I, I see, you know, I closely monitor the progress of my students, uh, those who take the boot camp from me, where I, where I teach them uh, step by step on, uh, on the entire thing. So I, I closely monitor it. I see what are the things, how they are doing a particular question, how they are, you know, attempting a particular question. And based upon that, I actually give them the requirement. So like, this is not you have to do like this. You probably have your scores would improve if you do the technique like this. So all of those things are something which I do it all the time. So because of observation and conversation, I want to understand what is your thought process, how you are thinking about it. So these things actually help us to gather the requirements. Then we also have the facilitation. So facilitation is actually a more structured as I discussed this earlier in the integration management also. So we have a uh, we have facilitated workshops like, you know, a more structured as compared to your uh, your focus group. You will have people from different different groups sitting in one room, giving you the requirements and uh, talking about like how one team is interacting with the other team, how these two different requirements are interacting with each other. This is this is more facilitated. It involves multiple parties, uh, you know, brought together to come up to requirements. There are some of the examples like uh, joint application development. I, 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 I told you JAD JAD sessions <clears throat> um, uh, are done uh, are an example of facilitation. If you remember, the moderator is there, the scriber is there, the recorder is there. All of them are, you know, helping uh, the the uh, you know, the moderator who is leading the discussion to gather the requirements that was joint application development. Then we also have QFD, uh, which is uh, quality function deployment, which is mainly used in uh, manufacturing industry where a customer needs are collected. This is also known as voice of customer. Um, so you don't have to go into much details about what this JAD session is or QFD session is. But really what you want to understand is that this is an example of facilitation technique. You might get a question in the exam where they're saying that you are a business analyst, uh, you are conducting a JAD session to gather the requirement. What type of technique did I did the business analyst used? So if one of the option is facilitation, that would be your correct answer. Then on the user story size, it, it will define the stakeholder role. 
advantages of features and who takes the advantages of uh, those features so user stories like you know like how a user is interacting with that system like you know like i am a person i am that stakeholder these are my tasks this is what i will do this is how i'll benefit out of that feature for me this is a user story another example of facilitation again if they talk about user stories remember they are referring to facilitation which is which would be your answer then next tool we have the nominal group technique so let's see what we have in this so nominal group technique this is um i i would say it's actually a combination of two techniques which is brainstorming and voting so how it is defined okay so for some of the important processes like uh, nominal group technique the close project uh, the change control process and we, you will also do the um, the project budget how it is formed all of these are actually on the blog on our website www.eduhubspot.com so go to the blog section uh you know go through these blogs i've i've explained those in in much more detail if you have any questions write those questions ask me and you know somebody from the team or 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 most probably i i would reply to those questions personally okay let's see nominal group technique first we have the problem so each group member write their ideas on on the problem so whatever problem you are facing you will write your ideas okay these are the things which could help us to resolve that problem okay then once you have defined the problem then you would probably you know document it so the moderator documents all their ideas on a flip chart once complete so if let's say i have to take requirements from 10 folks i would get ideas from all of those 10 folks and i would document it once the ideas are documented the third thing is 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 to review documented ideas are discussed among the group members so as a group members all 10 of you would brainstorm on those ideas you would discuss about those ideas and then finally we when we have to take a decision we'll probably go ahead and take a voting decision on that like for example group members rank the ideas on a scale of 1 to 5 after several repetitions highest scoring ideas would be selected so let's say um you came up with five requirements a b c d e stakeholder b came up with some other five let's say let's say two of them were common three of them were common and he came up with uh, let's say f g somebody with came other and then you will vote those ideas so i will say okay a i'm giving five b i'm giving three d i'm giving two e i'm giving one so you will rank those ideas similarly a uh, person b would also rank and again we will do this repeated times after we have all these ideas are sorted enough and you know i can and share it with everyone that these are the top 5 ideas so that's nominal group technique remember the keyword is brainstorming plus you will take a voting decision on that okay then we have the data representation tools we have uh, two types of data representation tools we have the uh affinity diagram and mind mapping so both affinity diagram as well as mind mapping are uh, you know are, are talking about ideas how you can gather the ideas from stakeholders in affinity diagram what you do is if you see this you know it's it's actually the uh, you know sticky notes which are helping you uh, to gather the require uh, to gather the requirements we also call it as post it on wall post it on wall same thing affinity diagram what you do is you whatever idea you come up with let's say i have 10 folks to gather the requirements all of us would give whatever we'll think we will you know post these sticky notes on the whiteboard and then the ideas which are together like you know which are similar i will group those uh, you know sticky notes together to make sure that you know the same ideas or something which belongs to the same group are together like for example um if i am referring to the engine so whatever uh, you know ideas we have related to engine will come under the category of engine then on the luxury side whatever requirements we have on the luxury side will fall under the bucket of luxury so that's affinity diagram which is also known as sticky notes or post it on wall then another data representation technique is the mind mapping so <coughs> so mind mapping is is uh, all about again visual representation which will 
explain the commonality and the difference in ideas to generate the new idea. So basically what you are doing is you are actually, you know, doing a backtrack. You are backtracking the uh, ideas. Like for example, if you see, you know, this is, let's say, uh, uh, you, you start with some kind of idea of website development. So you'll think, okay, website, I need five. I need the product uh, page. I also need the about us page. Then I need, let's say, a uh, classroom page. Okay, then product, what all things I need to add it in the product. I need the simulator. Then I need, let's say, ITTO sheet. I need the videos, questions, slides, you know, templates, all of So I can actually, what I'm doing is I'm backtracking those ideas. I'm going one after the other. I started with a very high level, which was uh, the website, then I developed into, you know, much more detail and, and I backtrack. That's mind mapping. And finally, we have the last two tools uh, in the collect requirements process. We have the context diagrams and prototypes. So context diagram. So you, so context diagram is all about, you know, how the system and the user, the people interact with each other. Like I'll give you a basic example of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, interaction with a bank, a banking system, an ATM or, or even the bank, uh, you know, you go personally. So how do you do it? Like, you know, you go there, you put your, uh, you know, your debit card, you put in your numbers, you, you want to do a withdrawal, you want to deposit a check or you want to, um, um, you know, you want to ch check your statement balance. Or you, you have plenty of options. So how? Varun as a user is interacting with that system, the ATM machine, that's, that's context diagram for you. And how that machine is responding to my request. Like for example, if I'm depositing something, you know, the, so that's, that's money is getting deposited. Similarly, if I can deposit, I can actually withdraw also, right? Okay, so we have the withdrawal statements as well. So again, this is like two way from user to the uh, system. And similarly from system to the user. And the last one we have the prototypes, which is a technique um, uh, through which an early model of expected product is built. So prototypes, we do deal with pro prototypes a lot of time. Our stakeholders, our customers are confused sometimes of what they really want. So we came up with a working model. We show them that you know, this is how we should do it. And uh, they like the system. They give us more requirements. We go back and you know work on those requirements and move ahead. That's, that's prototypes for you. Okay, so finally we are on the output section. Another important section. Um, we'll get two outputs from here. Uh, we'll get the requirement documentation and we will also get the requirements traceability matrix. So requirement documentation, remember the keyword was smart, which is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time bound. So in the requirement documentation, we will have, you know, the business requirements, your organization needs, uh, you know, why the organization really is doing this project, you know, what are the stakeholder requirements, what are your solution requirements, which includes both the functional and non-functional, your transition readiness requirements, your project requirements, your quality requirements, and you know, th this list is endless. Make sure you go back, you read the PIMBOK, you read all the bullet points and cover all of these, what all things are part of it. You might get a question which will say which of the following is not a part of requirement documentation or vice versa which of the following will be part of requirement documentation so you need to make sure that you are reading those bullet points in much more detail on the opposite side um, on the flip side we also have the requirements traceability matrix we also call it as rtm which is like which links the product requirements from the origin to the deliverable so it's, it's more like a table, um, you know, most of the time we have actually used a Microsoft Excel file, um, uh, you know, which tracks the requirement to its source, to its origin, and, and it is done throughout the project life cycle. I've actually also seen it as, uh, you know, linking the requirement to the project objectives and sometimes to the test cases as well. So that's your RTM. So this marks the, uh, no, oh, we still have the revision phase. Uh, let's see. So now let's let's discuss about the uh, the revision, uh, the study, what all things we learned. Uh, an important video, and you can see uh, it, it's pretty lengthy. 
and the reason um, you know we made it lengthy because we wanted to make sure that you cover each and everything in detail into this very important tools are very very important so let's see focus your efforts uh, to understand the primary outputs the requirement documentation and traceability matrix make sure whatever things are part of it are are covered read the bullet points in the pim box very important uh, know that this process happens early and i would say this happens multiple times if your uh, uh, stakeholders are confused they don't know what they really want then know that this process is significant in detailing the success of the project and stakeholder expectation so again if you miss a stakeholder it's a problem for you so make sure you first of all um, you have all the stakeholders and then you are you know detailing it out you try to ask questions from the stakeholders so that you can get more and more requirements you get more clarity about those requirements know that this process includes lot of tools which are important from exam perspective so the most important piece in this is the uh, the tools and techniques so this marks the completion of collect requirements process next uh, uh, process would be the define scope where we would talk about the high level description uh, of of those requirements we'll define those requirements in much more detail so stay tuned thank you